Hello everyone. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I am Jonathan Little. Today, we are going to be discussing how to crush loose poker players. Hope you're all having a fantastic morning. I know it's been a while since I've done a little brain fuel. Hope you all, you all are having a wonderful week, a wonderful life. I wish nothing but the best for all of you. Top of the morning to all of you. Thank you all for being here early today. Goodness gracious, let's get started. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how to crush loose poker players. And as always, you want to ask yourself, what does my opponent do incorrectly? Not just my opponent in general, but my specific opponent. And when playing against loose players, this is gonna be especially relevant because loose players do all sorts of things differently. You want to make sure you are getting out of line to take advantage of your specific opponent. Whenever you're playing, in your mind, make it really clear. Ask yourself, what is this specific player doing incorrectly? Are they raising too often? Are they limping too often? Are they calling the flop in the turn and then folding the river too often? Are they calling down all the way too often, right? And it's a very obvious example of why you want to be very specific about what your particular opponent does incorrectly. Imagine you're playing against a loose player who plays a lot of hands, but one loose player folds on the river with all their junk. The other loose player calls on the river with king high and better every time, no matter what. Well, obviously your strategy is going to be very diff different against these two specific loose players, even though they're both loose, right? They both fall into this category. All right. So you want to be very, very, very specific and adjust and exploit whatever your opponent does incorrectly. Say you know your opponent will call the flop and call the turn with any sort of gut shot, backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw, whatever, but then they're going to fold the river every time, right? Don't just think, okay, they're loose. No, you need to figure out what they specifically do incorrectly. So if they are going to fold on the river too often, well, bluff the river a lot, right? If they're going to call the river every time, well, don't bluff the river a lot and value bet way more thinly, right? So always consider exactly what your opponent does incorrectly and then actually be willing to adjust and exploit. So many poker players are pretty good at figuring out what their opponents do wrong, but then they just keep trying to play, call it GTO poker. Not that they necessarily even know what GTO poker is, but if you know what your opponent does wrong, you need to be willing to get out of line to take advantage of it. Otherwise, you're going to be leaving a ton of money on the table. If you have any questions as we go through this, please let me know. This is a relatively short presentation today, so sit back, have a little brain fuel, enjoy your morning. Make the most of it. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, says Kevin Smith. Give, well, do Kevin Smith a favor, click the like and subscribe button down below. All right. Understand that loose does not necessarily mean that your opponents play aggressively, okay? Loose does not mean aggressive. I want to make that crystal clear. A lot of people think loose aggressive, loose aggressive player. That's a loose aggressive player. But a lot of the worst players you're going to play against are loose passive players, right? You can play a whole lot of hands but still be quite passive. You see this all the time in small stakes games where it goes limp, 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 and then another player limps behind with the 9-4 the offsuit because it's a cheap flop, a cheap potty wants to see the flop, right? And that is obviously a big mistake. And this player is loose, but this player is not aggressive. So if someone is loose but passive, and then all of a sudden they want to put a lot of money in the pot, they probably have a pretty good hand, right? I mean, I see this all the time where someone plays even kind of aggressive. They're kind of loose, kind of aggressive, but then all of a sudden on the river, they decide to put in the check raise. And a lot of players convince themselves in their mind that, well, this player's loose. I should probably call without realizing when this player check raises on the river, they have the nuts literally every time. We've seen this time and time again going through YouTube content that when people check raise the river, they usually have the nuts, even if they're loose, even if they're aggressive. So if someone is loose and passive and then they want to put in a lot of aggression, they almost always have a very good hand and you need to get out of the way. Also, most players who are too loose either limp far too often or raise far too often. If someone is loose but passive and it goes limp, 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 and then they raise, whereas normally they limp, 
when they do raise, they probably have a very good hand, right? So you want to look for spots where all opponents are going to essentially turn their range face up by an aggressive action. Um, for most players, this is not pre-flop. Pre-flop, they're playing good strong ranges, good GTO ranges, right? Most people have studied charts. It's not that hard. On the flop, most people continuation bet pretty reasonably in the medium and high stakes today. But when you get to the turn, that's when most people start losing a lot of their bluffs and they start to become pretty honest. And especially on the river, that's when people typically become quite honest. Um, and if people ever put in a check raise on the turn or the river, that's almost always very, very, very face up as a pretty good hand. Okay? So figure out what your particular opponent does incorrectly and understand that loose does not necessarily mean aggressive. He was at the casino last night and every three bet got called. This dude won every time. You beat your pocket tens with a 7-3. All right, enjoy. Was it fun? Hope you had a good time. I ran a 100-person poker tournament at a big NFT party a few days ago. I went all in for 10 big blinds. We were short stacked with the king queen and my partner in the deck of degeneracy project decided he announces i've never beat jonathan little in hand i'm going to call with anything yeah he called the four three he got me do i feel bad no do i care not that much it happens understand that whenever you get it in with 65 percent equity you're going to win 65 percent of the time Understand that 65% is not 100%. A lot of people think that 65% is 100% and those numbers are different. Hopefully you all know that 100 is a decent amount greater than 65. So when the 35 option happens, you should not be too sad. Are calling stations categorized in the same way? Well, no, because if you think about it, calling stations can be loose or tight. Imagine someone's super tight. They only play aces and they never fold it. They're a calling station post flop. They're not folding, right? But they're super tight. Whereas if someone's playing 50% of hands and they're calling station and they call it with all sorts of junk, then yeah, uh, you're going to want to make sure you can get well out of line and take advantage of them. But I mean, look, anytime anyone does anything incorrectly, then you need to adjust and take advantage of them. How would you handle over online poker ban? I don't know what that means. What does not work on poker bros? I would definitely recommend you play on licensed, legal, regulated sites. Please do not play on unlicensed, unregulated, illegal gambling sites. Uh, that typically will not work out for you some portion of the time. I'm trying to help you protect your money. Please, please, please protect your money. Don't be a fool. Okay. How would you adapt multi-way with both loose and tight players in the pot? Well, Ask, again, when you have multiple players in the pot, what are they doing incorrectly, right? Sometimes they're doing nothing incorrectly, but sometimes they are. If someone is far too loose and someone is far too tight, well, you can bet. And if the loose player sticks around, great. They have all sorts of junk. If the tight player sticks around, maybe not so great. They probably have a pretty good hand. But this is probably a, a better question to illustrate with some hand examples. I mean, off the top of my head, say you raise with, I don't know, pocket eights. And then a loose player calls and a tight player calls. And it comes... 10, 6, 3. It's normally a board you want to check a lot of the time, but in this scenario, you can easily bet. And if the loose player calls, great. You're probably in okay shape on 10, 6, 3 with pocket eights. But if you bet and the tight player calls, probably not so much, right? So always want to consider how your opponents are going to be playing. All right, next. Let's discuss players who specifically play ranges that are too wide and some of the things they do incorrectly so that you can adjust to exploit them. What should you do if someone limps too often? Let me pull up Equilab real quick. We'll quickly try to go through some basic adjustments. Say the cutoff limps and you know they limp with all sorts of trash. They limp all sorts of trash. What should we raise with? Well, obviously there's no quote unquote GTO chart for this because your opponent's not playing anywhere near GTO. But if they are limping with all sorts of trash, you can be quite aggressive if they're going to fold their trash some portion of the time. You probably get away with raising something like this. As you see, this is about 45% of hands. Now, the question is, should you raise substantially wider than this? 
because this is not all that wide. This is just like normal button open raising range, right? But should we raise wider? Can you reasonably raise wider? Well, again, you have to ask, what do they do wrong? What do they do wrong? Well, if they're going to call you down with all sorts of junk, you don't really want to go around raising with the six high and the five high and the jack high that are junk. This is not a good strategy. So the idea of punish the limpers by raising, um, well, how are you going to punish them if they're going to call you down with queen high when you have seven high? It doesn't work, right? So perhaps you want to do a lot of limping behind. Maybe you only raise pretty linearly. Maybe you actually do a decent amount of limping. Maybe you raise with something like this even. Kind of tight, really. Maybe you raise only with something like this. That could definitely be a reasonable strategy if your opponent is going to call your raise with all sorts of trash and then call down very wide on all betting rounds. And this would result in you limping all these suited hands that we just had fold, maybe limp some of these okay connected hands, etc. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think a lot of people get it in their heads. They have to raise the limper every single time because you want to punish the limpers, but you don't punish them by letting them put their money in good. Now, they are out of position. They're going to underrealize their equity. They're going to have a lot of trash. But, I mean, if you have a lot of trash, it doesn't really help you because then your ranges are all on top of each other. That's not good. If you are playing a game where you have a big rake, as Stu says right here, 10% rake up to $10. Ugh, terrible game. If you're playing a terrible game with high rake, uh, you probably don't want to limp at all. So maybe you just raise with roughly a regular button raising range, maybe a touch tighter if they're going to call you down kind of wide. However, if they're going to fold to your raise, like let's say you're playing 1-3 no limit, it goes cut off limp, you're on the button. If you make it $20, kind of big, not so big in most games, but kind of big in reality, Will your opponent just fold out almost everything that's not good and realize they're going to raise all their hands that are good so they don't have much, they're going to fold every time? Well, if they're going to fold out almost every time, then you can raise with close to any two cards, maybe any two cards. All of them. Because that particular player is going to fold far too often. All right, let's read the comments. What would you say poker is on a percent scale you think it's 60 percent luck 40 percent skill that's a terrible question it's a terrible question it's a terrible question come on everybody come on we can do better than this all right let's see uh i'm gonna give you a very quick example there's a website called pokerdope.com let's look at poker tools tournament variance calculator actually let's look at poker variance calculator let's say you're gonna win in live cash games, 10 big blinds per 100 hands, nice, reasonable win rate, low for live, high for online. Let's say you're going to play a whole session live, a long session. You're going to play 300 hands. Well, if we ran this 20 times, here's break even this black line here. Half the time, this, this thin black line here, not this one. Half the time you're down, half the time you're up. Therefore, it's all luck. Therefore, it's all luck. You heard it right here first, everybody. Poker's all luck. You see the black line, the thick black line? Thin black line here is break even. Thick black line is how much you're going to win on average. Just a little bit. Sometimes you smash them. Sometimes you get smashed. This is 20 days of live poker. All right, fine. What if instead we're going to play... It's got a cal handy calculator. We're going to play 300 hands for, let's say, 300 days in the year. 90,000 hands. 90,000 hands. We're going to play for a year. Oh my gosh, we win almost every time. Who'd have thought? Sometimes you run bad and you lose a little bit. Every other time you're up. It's all skill, 100% skill. You see, the question's a bad question because the amount of hands you put in is what is very relevant. Over time, you win all the time. Let's say we do this for 10 years. Obviously, you're just going to smash them and win all the money. Now, sometimes you do run bad. Sometimes you do run good. This black line here is average. You see all the lines are getting closer and closer to average because that's how it works. And um, over time, variance is irrelevant. You just win all the money. If you're playing live poker and your win rate's like 25 big blinds per 100 hands, now it's just like a beautiful straight up line. Basically, no luck. No luck whatsoever over 10 years. Over one year, 
Same story, you'll never lose in live poker. You will literally never lose if you have a 25 big blind per 100 hand win rate. Over a day though, it's all over the place. So the question is, are you a child? I was gonna say a baby, I was gonna give you a little bit more credit. Are you a child? If you're a child and you care about what happens today, I need my immediate gratification. If you're a child and you need immediate gratification, poker's not for you because, well, you care about things that don't matter. All that really matters is do you win indefinitely in the long run? And you will win indefinitely in the long run. Okay? Oh, Jesus, you caught it live. Good morning. You ended up $300 after a short series. Again, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Everyone always wants to talk about variance. All right, let's go over and look at tournaments. Tournament variance calculator. Let's say you're playing tournaments that have 500 players. How many people get paid? Let's say 75. Let's say we're playing uh, $100 buy-in tournaments. $11 rake. Let's say we're playing um, with a 30% return on investment. Some, this is going to be like, let's, say, let's actually make this like 150 person tournaments. This is going to be what's happening at a lot of local casinos. Let's make it 100 person tournaments, actually. 100 person tournaments, 15% get paid. $100 buy-in, rake's $11. Maybe they rake $12, whatever. Let's say we have 30% ROI and we're going to play a short session. We're going to play seven tournaments. Sample size of seven. Calculate. It's going to be a joke. It's a joke, right? You can play seven tournaments. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Each line here is a sample. Uh, this is a little bit too big. Uh, that's not going to help. All right, whatever. As you see, the results are stupid. It doesn't really matter. It's ridiculous. Okay, let's say instead we're going to play a whole year. We're going to play a tournament almost every day for a year. Variance is still going to be all over the place. I'm not exactly sure how many this is. We're supposed to do here. We're gonna play 300 tournaments. Now we start to see some real looking results, right? Sure, sometimes you lose, but usually 30% ROI over 300 games, you usually end up winning in small field tournaments over a year. Now, say you're gonna play online, you're gonna play 15 tournaments a day. You got the calculator 15 tournaments a day times 300 days a year equals 4,500 tournaments. See what we're looking at now. Now, well, you just win again. How about that? No luck in the long run. You just win all the money. So is it luck or is it skill? The answer is, well, a little bit of both. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but thinking about it doesn't even matter. All that matters is what actually happens in the long run. You just need to ride one good upswing at the nosebleeds. Technically, you can just play the lottery and get a lot of money and then not worry about poker. Technically, you can walk outside and get hit by a bus and survive and sue the, con the country or the state or the city for $26 million, and then you're rich. Technically, you can go make a baseball parlay today and pick all the underdogs, and they all win, and then you have a million dollars on your $20 ticket. I don't know the right number. It's probably not a million. Technically, like, poker's a great way to get rich slow. It's a horrible way to get rich quick. A lot of people think that they're trying to get rich quick. Get rich, that's a tongue twister. Get rich quick. And that's why they all fail. I don't want you all to fail. I want you to realize that poker is a great way to get rich slowly, find a game you can beat, have an edge, play it a lot, and you cannot lose. I am a big fan of not losing. And I've made a point to set myself up in poker to the point that I could not lose. I've made a point to primarily play mostly games where I cannot lose in the long run. And that's what most people who make it do. They're not playing with a tiny edge. They're not playing way too big. They're playing in games where they have an edge. They're keeping a proper bankroll and they play a lot. And that's it. That's all I gotta do. All right, next. You should three bet people's raises a lot if they are raising far too wide, okay? So let's say cut off raises with, I don't know, this range. Let's just say they're kind of nuts. They're kind of nuts. Here they're raising with 57% of hands instead of the 30-ish percent of hands they should be raising. 
what should our adjustment be? Well, you probably just want to 3-bet a lot. That said, you could call and 3-bet polarize. I think calling and 3-betting polarize is reasonable. That said, against someone who's going to raise with all sorts of junk and then call your 3-bet with all sorts of junk, you actually want to be 3-betting quite linearly, which means with just a lot of the best hands. You want to be 3-betting with like King-8 suited and better and stuff like Queen-9 suited, Jack-9 suited. Lots of pairs, maybe all the pairs even. Uh, maybe something like sixes are better. Maybe you want to call the small pairs still. Stuff like ace-8 offsuit can raise, right? You want to be raising with hands that crush the bottom portion of this calling range, whereas you would normally never 3-bet the ace-8 offsuit for value, right? You never 3-bet the ace-8 offsuit for value, but you can if someone's going to call your 3-bet with ace-2 offsuit and 9-7 offsuit and 8-7 offsuit and 6-4 suited, right? If they're going to call with all sorts of junk, you should be 3-betting far more linearly. That said, if they're going to fold a lot, you should be three betting with far more bluffs. So again, you see, it's not just what do you do against someone who's loose, it's what do you do against someone who has this particular leak, right? You want to make sure that you are ma making a point to actively exploit whatever your particular opponent does incorrectly. Let me tell you what kind of downswings you can expect if you play cash games with a little edge. Well, how much of an edge is a little edge? This, so this website, primedope.com, here, I'll type it in the chat. We'll give you all the answers. You just have to type in what your edge is. That's it. That's it. You just got to know your edge. You got to know how much you're going to play. Everyone likes to cry about variance in the short run because they do not understand how to win at gambling games slash how edges are extracted. Consider roulette. Consider the roulette wheel. You think the casino gets mad whenever you hit your 1 in 37, 38, 39 in some places now? Whenever you hit your 1 in, one in whatever? No, they don't care at all. Because they know every time you spin the wheel, you lose the rake. Every time your opponents play with you and you're in an advantage, they lose whatever your edge is. Plus the rake. That's it. That's what's happening here. Yeah, sometimes you win. Yeah, sometimes you lose. But it doesn't matter because we're playing a long run game. Okay. Are you going to play the main event? I am going to play the main event. I have played the main event every year since I was 21 years old. I have yet to win the tournament. Should I cry about how unlucky I am? I haven't won the main event yet. I've played it every time. No, because it's ridiculous. Let's go over here. Let me show you something. Um, so we've been looking so far at 100-person tournaments. What if we have 10,000 people in the tournament? Hmm, 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 hmm. They can only pay 700 people. Let's say we have uh, 5,000 people in the tournament. Fine. 5,000 people. Not even the main event. $100 buy-in, all the rank. Okay. Let's say we're going to play a whole life of the main event. Let's say we're going to play 60 times. There we go. We're going to play 60 times. You think we're going to win? or mo You think we're going to mostly win or mostly lose? I can already tell you, we are going to mostly lose. We're going to be down basically every time. All right. This is 20 samples. We have one gigantic winner, one, two pretty good winners, and the other 17 times we ran this, we lost. You played your whole life in the main event, and you lost. What if we, what if we get ourselves a bigger return on investment? What if we are crushing and we have 75% return on investment? Certainly, that'll help us. We'll be a winner every time, right? I click calculate. Let's try again. Did I break the website? Please don't make me re-enter all this information. I think I broke the website. Oh, there it goes. All right. Just took some time. Here we go. We have one gigantic winner. One, two. Two, win two other small winners. And uh, 17 break-evens or losers. You can't even see it. It's not even on the screen. Can't even get it on the screen. I'm so tilted that I'm going to play my whole life in the main event and probably be a loser. Tough. Tough, 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 huh? Sometimes you win. Usually you lose. Want me to make you even more sad? Let's say instead of playing it for our entire life. Let's say we're playing online tournaments. We play uh, 4,500 of them in a year. We're playing a lot of these. We're gonna play a lot of these. We're playing online, so let's be real. Let's say we have 50% return on investment. We're still smashing them. Oh, how depressing. 
you can play big field tournaments and roughly break even or win only a small amount 25% of the time. You're going to devote your whole year to playing small stakes, soft, 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 soft tournaments online with a big win rate, and you're still going to roughly break even or lose 20-ish, 25-ish percent of the time. That's why you want this number to be quite low. This number here, number of players in the tournament is very important. You want to play small field tournaments if you don't like variance. Let's actually make this more realistic. Say we have like 25% return on investment. It's going to make you even more sad. Ugh. 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 Lots of losers. We have a few lo actual losers over a year. We have a lot of barely winnings over a year. A few people went big. Look at this guy. Look at this guy in green. This, this green one that ended up winning the most. Isn't this nuts? This is a simulation over the course of a year. This guy just basically got trashed for a year and then just started winning every tournament. <laughs> Variance is funny. This guy got clobbered for half a year. Then all of a sudden, the poker god smiled on him. Now he's God's gift to poker. And you know, if you keep running out this, sometimes he's going to get trashed again and go right back into the dumpster. Sometimes he's going to crush the games, etc., etc. The more players not mean more fish. More players do mean more fish. That's why it gave us a high return on investments. I'm not going to test this for you. You can go to do it yourself. I literally just typed in the URL for you. I, I mean, I'm not going to do it all for you. You got to do it yourself. Type in whatever you want. There it is. So if you're saying 50% ROI, yeah, you're not going to have 50% ROI in live poker. I was trying to be generous to you here. As you see, I went back and I changed it to 25%, which is still generous to the vast majority of people. Um, in live poker, though, and like the main event, I would not be shocked if lifetime I have like 100% ROI. I think that's probably about right. Some pros think they have like an egregiously big ROI. Um, like 300%. I don't think you have 300%. But I do think it's probably reasonable to have about 100% if you're very good. Anyway, let's stop complaining about variance, everyone. Realize that variance exists. Understand what's probably likely to happen. I actually got a nice lesson in this by a guy, JC Tran. Old school poker player, long time ago. We used to play a ton together at Bellagio all the time. He was always there. I was always there. Chopped the tournament with him once. Um, he basically told me that if you play every No Limit Hold'em tournament at the World Series of Poker, you're going to get a bracelet one out of 10 years. And I went home and did some math. Turns out that's about right. They had, they had fewer tournaments back then. Now maybe it's like one in eight or something if you play all of them. Not that I'm playing all of them. I got a wife and kids. I'm staying at home all the time. And uh, it's important to be realistic. It's important to be realistic. A lot of people are not realistic. They think they're just going to win all the time. And you are going to win sometimes. You're going to win all the time in the long run. If you're good. But there's variance in the short run. Get used to it. All right, next. What do we do against someone who calls too often? If someone calls too often, what should you do? Well, you should value bet far wider. And you should also probably semi-bet a little bit more often as well. Because when you semi, well, semi, say semi bet, semi bluff more often. When you semi bluff with a good draw, semi bluffing is when you're betting with a draw that's behind when you get called, but has the potential to improve to very strong hand. When you do get there, you want the pot to be big. So it's usually good to bet with your draws more often. It's also good to value bet much wider. So let's say on the flop, normally in GTO world, suppose you're supposed to check like top pair, bad kicker, and worse, um, made hands, which is often the case. <clears throat> Against someone who's going to call you with all sorts of junk, well then, value bet far wider, like bottom pair, right? <clears throat> I did not mention sizing here. Uh, Mikhail definitely points it out, though. You can definitely bet bigger for value. Yeah. Bets perhaps even like kind of smaller as a semi bluff and bet far larger for value if they're just going to call you if they don't really care about your bet size. Now, I will say that some people will care about your bet size. They're going to realize if you pot it with all the made hands and you a third pot it with all your semi bluffs, well, that's not going to work out. They're going to figure that out kind of quickly if they're anywhere near competent. Some people are not competent though and they will not know what's happening at all. We have opening ranges for loose. 
games on our site. We actually do have adjusted GTO preflop charts. I don't necessarily think they are perfect because it depends on your exact scenario, right? And we say like, how loose are your opponents? What did they do wrong? Literally everything I'm talking about here, this is why you cannot develop 100% accurate charts. That said, we have done our best to make live cash game charts that are not GTO, um, not designed to be GTO. We have GTO charts as well, but they are designed to take advantage of loose, splashy games. So yes, we do have that on our site in the tools section. If someone raises more than two or three big blinds, let's say $25 on a one-do table, should you three bet to 75? It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you do want to three bet them, I think 75 may be too big if you're playing $300 deep or $200 deep, right? You can go to more like 60. They are going to call you a lot. That's fine, but they're putting in money quite poorly, assuming that's their standard default raise size. I've been out partying all week. For NFT NYC. It was a long week. I spoke at the conference. That's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. Spoke at the conference. Don't steal my... Are you can you? Yeah, you can take my QR code. There you go. Yeah. VIP speaker. Got to give a speech by myself. Who'd have thought? Not on poker. But now my voice is wrecked because I've been screaming at people all night at parties. People will learn how you play much faster than you learn how they play. And eh, I don't know about that. I mean, look, some people who play really, really poorly are just straight up oblivious when it comes to whatever their opponents do. They're just playing. They're just mashing buttons. And that's not good, <laughs> right? They're going to be making blunders left and right. They don't care what you're doing. Um, quite often, you will be able to know what your opponent's doing correctly pretty quickly if they are making the same mistakes over and over and over. Say you're playing live poker, and they literally limp every single hand. Or six hands. They limp every hand for six hands. You only have a six-hand sample on them. Should you assume they're limping with everything? Do you think they're going to limp every hand? The answer is probably yes, at least for a while. They may stop eventually. But you should presume when they limp the seventh time that they probably have junk. Why are you screaming at people? It's very loud at the club slash art gallery with 5,000 people in it. It was a fun time, though. All right, next. You're going to want to bluff more often on the river. I know a lot of people really hate the idea of bluffing against someone who has called them on the flop and called them on the turn. But if your opponent is going to get to the river with a lot of busted draws or even junk made hands like bottom pair or king high or ace high, your adjustment is to bluff them like mad, especially if they are going to fold all of their hands that are weaker than something like middle pair. If they're going to get to the river with literally king high and better, and all the busted draws, you should be bluffing like crazy because they're only going to call a river bet like a third of the time or something. And this is especially powerful if you can get away with using a smallish river bet to something like a third pot or half pot, right? Because then you're picking up the pot very, very frequently. Your bluff doesn't need to work all that often. If you bet half pot, you need to steal the pot a third of the time to profit, a third of the time or more. But if they're going to fold on the river when... Well, if they're going to fold on the river with two-thirds of their rage, you need them to fold a third of the time. They're going to fold two-thirds of the time. You're just printing money. <laughs> when you bet small on your bluffs against calling stations, you don't want to bluff all that often against calling stations. Depends on how big of a calling station your opponent is, right? If your opponent's going to call you on the river with literally king high and better, and they have literally king high and better, well, then obviously don't bluff. Now, a lot of times they will have king high and better and also busted draws, if that's the case, and they will fold their busted draws to any bet, and they're going to call any bet with king high and better, because they're super duper calling stations, then it becomes quite nice to use small bluffs, because the small bluffs are just designed to get them to fold out 10 high, right? Now, obviously, that implies you have worse than 10 high. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. If you got to the river somehow with worse than 10 high against a calling station, you probably screwed up, assuming the pot's decently big. Did you limp with aces? No. Is this live? It's delayed by about two seconds. I think what 
a lot of people get tricked up on or fail to realize is that you should be adjusting to take advantage of whatever your particular opponent does wrong. Ask yourself, what does my particular opponent do incorrectly? Not in general, your particular opponent. And usually the answer is pretty obvious, right? If your opponent folds too often on the river, what should you do? Well, depends on their range, right? But assuming their range is super wide and full of junk, well then, bluff a lot, right? If they're gonna call you on the river every time, because they're super duper calling stations, don't bluff a lot and value bet far th way, way, way wider, right? Thanks to T-Dubs for 14 months for you subscribe on Twitch. I appreciate it. If you are watching on Twitch and you're an Amazon Prime member, I know a lot of people have Amazon Prime, they give you a free subscription each month. Go find a content creator you like and give it to them. Cost you $0. Cost Amazon $5 or $2.50 or something like that. And it supports the content creators. If you're on YouTube, click the like button, click the subscribe button, click the notification bell. All that stuff helps. Old Man Coffee always calls you on the river, LOL. So um, Old Man Coffee, as we sip our brain fuel, <clears throat> is a player type some people refer to as weak, tight, old, nitty guy. And yeah, weak, tight, old, nitty guys only playing good hands. If the opponent's only playing good hands, well, they're not going to fold because when they get to the river, they have a good hand. Against a weak, tight, passive player, if you bet the flop and they call, and you bet the turn and they call, and you bet the river... If they're folding out middle pair and worse on the turn, that means they have top pair or better. Well, <laughs> you should probably not bluff them on the river, right? So going back to what we talked about very early in this talk is that if your opponent, well, you want to find where your opponent starts to play honestly, right? Like a lot of people could call continuation bets kind of wide, but if you make a decently sized bet on the turn and your opponent calls, a lot of players right there, that's when it becomes very obvious they have something pretty good, Right? And if you know your opponent has something pretty good, then don't bluff nearly as often as you should. There's been a lot of talk recently about the high rollers aren't exciting enough. What do you think about Jaffe? I don't know which Jaffe you're referring to. There's a few of them in the poker space. Saying that high rollers aren't entertaining. I do not think it's a high roller poker player's, a high rolling poker player's job at all to be an entertainer especially if they're not being paid to entertain. A lot of the poker sites back in the day would, um, would sponsor poker players. Part of their job was to entertain. Dale Negreanu wrote a very nice, good post about this the other day. Um, something along the lines of... Well, let's see if I can pull it out. Let's see. Let's see, let's see. Wrong account. Whatever. Please no not suitable for work stuff. Keep it safe. Oh, nice one. That's some good art right there. Down to Grano. What did he say? He said something very good. Uh, come on, Daniel. Make it easy for me. Here we go. Here it is. You are replaceable until you're not. And I've always kind of subscribed to this thought process, this logic as well. If you're trying to build a brand and to get to the status where you actually warrant pay for views, then it's in your best interest to take the worst of it. I didn't understand this for a long time in my poker career. I sat there with headphones, hoodie, didn't talk to anybody, just tried to play good poker like the high roller players do today. And yeah, you're going to win a little bit more money from poker, but, but you're not going to be making... Well, you're not making a brand. You're just sitting there playing cards. Let's keep reading. They use you while you're, you are using them. Early in career, I answered 50 to 100 personal emails a day to grow a grassroots band, brand for free. Hey, what do you think we're doing right here right now? WPT asked you to host a Hollywood home game six, for six days of work for $250. They were using me, but I was also using them. If I didn't do it, somebody else would. That's a very similar story. One time, WPT had, uh, they had this, it was, what was this? I forget exactly how it went down because it was a few years ago, but they had some final tables in, I want to say Marrakesh. So not the New York City time zone at all. I'm like, yeah, we're going to stream the final table and it's going to take like three hours. I'm like, fine, good, whatever, no problem. I'll wake up at 5 a.m. and 4 a.m. and do it, whatever it is. Um, I get there and they're actually down to 19 players, not six. So it's going to take a while, whatever. Um, I'm being paid, I think I'm doing this for free, zero dollars. 
Just me. Just me by myself. I'm just doing it for free for fun. And um, <laughs> yeah, the thing went like 19 hours. Very, very long. It went incredibly long. So I sat there streaming for free by myself, commentating on relatively non-exciting live poker for 19 hours for free. Happy to do it. Part of the job if you're trying to grow a brand. For those who don't know, I have a training site, pokercoaching.com. We warrant pay for views. Not a whole lot of people warrant pay for views, but you're replaceable until you're not. You saw the benefit for your own brand getting the exposure and they get to underpay you as a result. Yeah. Your advice for those wanting to build a brand for sponsorships or access to good streams or private games. Excellent advice here. Be easy to work with. What's that mean? It means don't be a jerk. I mean, show up on time. It means stay late. It means help in whatever way you possibly can, right? Don't cause trouble. Next, be accommodating. Right? It's a kind of similar thing. And be a long-term thinker. Understand that you have to sow seeds. You got to plant seeds. I plant a lot of seeds. And some of them turn into amazing things. Some of them die. And it's all A-OK. -okay. Take the worst of it until you no longer have to and reap the benefits in the end. You're replaceable until you're not. Right? Completely agree with all this. I think that is excellent and should high rollers be entertaining. They don't have to be. They, they, they should not feel pressure to be. Right? Because they're not being paid to. Now, if they wanted to pay every poker player $1,000 a day to show up with the idea that when you're at the feature table, you got to be entertaining, then, uh, yeah, you have a bit more, a bit more uh, reason to be entertaining, right? But, I mean, I hate to break it to all of you, not a whole lot of high-rolling poker players are getting good sponsorship deals. It's not like it used to be. Back in the day, people were getting $50,000 or $100,000 a month just to show up and act like a buffoon on the stream. And you know what? You had crazy buffoon poker players acting insane on TV all the time. Why? Because the money they were playing for didn't matter. They're getting paid $50,000 or $100,000 a month to act like an idiot. Obviously, they're going to do whatever they want. They don't really care if they win at poker. However, now a good sponsorship deal, especially on a lot of the American-facing sites, is rake back in $1,000 a month. Not that good of a deal, honestly. So, if you're not getting that good of a deal, and you very much care about the poker you're playing, well, you can expect them to take the poker very, 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 very seriously. So, understand, it is not the poker player's responsibility to be entertaining if they're not being paid to be entertainers. And I'll go ahead and tell you, you don't want to pay a lot of the players to be entertaining because they're not that entertaining. So, that's that. I do, I do definitely subscribe to the Negranu theory there of show up, do good work, make, you know, be, be good and easy to work with. I mean, I tried this my whole career. Now lots of people want to work with me and I, now I'm the one who gets to say no, right? Whenever you're starting building a brand, you have to kind of say yes to everything. If any opportunity comes along, yes, 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 yes. But now once uh, you, you make a decent name for yourself and you already weren't pay for views, as he said, then you can be way more selective and you can kind of do whatever you want within reason. That said, I still do a whole lot of stuff for free. Just as entertainment, because you never know where it's going to go. Just uh, the other day, I was invited to play poker with Gary Vaynerchuk. He's an internet marketer. It's supposed to be a free-to-play game. Turns out we ended up playing $5,000 buy-in games, a little bit different. <laughs> I took second place to get my money back, so all good. But why did Jonathan Little, a random guy who I don't know Gary Vaynerchuk beyond, I mean, I like, I like his work, but why is he reaching out to me of all people? And... I didn't even find out the answer to that, but I can only presume it's because I show up and I do the work all day, every day, and something I did somewhere along the way got on his radar or the radar of his team, and they decided to invite me. Tonight, I'm playing a nice, friendly, casual 50, 100, 200 game. In the city, no rake. Why do I get invited to this? Well, because I'm easy to work with. I show up on time, I'm fun, fun enough, I, uh, I pay when I lose, right? I'm, I'm not a jerk when I, when I lose or when I win, right? People kind of like me. And it all goes back to that, right? 
where you're easy to work with and, and you do like that. That's really it. Just don't be a jerk. <laughs> don't be a jerk and be very willing to give and you will be rewarded far beyond whatever you could possibly imagine. There are some courses that are crazy complicated. If a course is crazy complicated, I would venture to say it's probably not good. What makes a good course? Now, here's where many people disagree. But I think a good course is something that actually teaches you how to do what it says it's going to teach you to do. I, at PokerCoaching.com, hired someone who owned one of the biggest college tutoring websites that taught people college courses better than professors to make the design and outline of the biggest courses on PokerCoaching.com. We have our fundamentals course, a free crash course. Also, we have a tournament master class and a cash game master class that are both 40-something hours long. And... I had these kind of made, but then I showed it to this guy and he's like, look, we can do a whole lot better. And we did. We spent a lot of time making these, like thousands of hours. And I think it's worth it. And I know that people go to pokercoaching.com and they study and they learn and they get a whole lot better at poker, which is exactly what we're going for. Um, I definitely do agree that a lot of courses that have excellent content are presented in a way that is confusing, complicated, difficult to understand, et cetera. And I think that's, well, bad, bad for them and good for me because <laughs> I put out the ones that are, that, that have very, very high level content, but are also easy to understand by design. And that design took a whole lot of effort. I'm not gonna go through and talk about everybody's courses and classes and all of that. All right, all right, all right. That's gonna be it for today. I have a webinar starting in 10 minutes at pokercoaching.com. We are going to be going through, what are we going through today? This question. What is our question for the day? This is too big. Whatever. In a tournament against competent opponents with a 40 blind stack, action folds to you in the low jack. What is your strategy? What do you do with your whole range? Suppose you raise a 2.2, only the button calls. Flop comes 6-3-3. What is your strategy? Suppose you bet four button calls, turns eight of diamonds, backdoor flush draw. What do we do? So as we check, button checks. River is a queen of hearts. What do we do? I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you. You want to go through it really, 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 really fast. Here's our pre-flop raising range. Nice, easy, standard stuff. On the flop, 633, we have to do a lot of checking because we're out of position. When we bet, we're going to bet using a big size because we have all the over pairs and the opponent does not. So we essentially have a range advantage here, right? But we're out of position, so we have to do a lot of checking. As you do see, we're betting 60% most of the time or checking. I bet if we ran this for more bet sizes, it may even use bigger bet sizes some portion of the time. But whatever. Notice most of our bets are going to come from over pairs that are vulnerable, right? Notice sevens bets more than aces, for example. And then we're going to have a lot of cards that wrap around the six primarily. So we're going to see a lot of stuff like eight, seven, um, nine, seven, stuff like that. That has like low cards that if we bet and get called, the cards that we have are going to be super live. So notice a lot of these hands in this region are betting, right? Fine. Say we bet, opponent calls. Turns to eight of diamonds. We check. That's going to make our range pretty pretty weak, right? Notice we are betting the turn kind of frequently with all of our over pairs for the most part. Still, Ace is doing a lot of slow playing, which is fun. But again, lots of cards that have straight draws and flush draws are going to be betting all the cards in this region, pretty logically. River is the queen. After we go, it goes check, check. Now our range is very, very small at this point. The queen's going to be really good for us, though. Notice we have a lot of queens here, which is good. Notice eights can definitely bet for value if we have them, not that we have them very often. But we have a lot of ace queen here, which is excellent. A lot of queens, which is excellent. Notice this ace just slow playing itself to tears. Kind of surprised to see aces just check, 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 check. <laughs> it's nice to protect your range, right? You protect your range by very often including your hands that are almost always good and not vulnerable to being outdrawn, and aces is that. Fun stuff. We're going to go through this, also discuss implementable strategies, and perhaps even a little bit more at PokerCoaching.com starting very soon. If you're not a Poker Coaching member, go to PokerCoaching.com, sign up. The webinar starts in eight minutes. That's going to be it for today. I hope you have a great, great week. I'm finally back home. I've been on the road or busy for like five weeks straight. It's been a whirlwind, but I'm glad to get home, grind out some work, and add value to all of you. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. Click the like and subscribe button below. Thank you for being here, and I will talk to all of you.